So let's get started. So the topic of our discussion today uh, is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, and it took me a while to reflect back on what do I study? You know, the, the COVID does this to you. Like, what am I studying and why? And I found some patterns in front of my prior research, but also helped me think about my future research. And a common theme for me was always about studying growth. So most of my research has been about studying growth, growth of companies in good times and bad times. So, so the idea is looking at companies in up markets and down markets. So I'm going to try and crystallize and synthesize a lot of my own research into some form of a framework that I think is going to help us today. So let me get started. Without further ado, if you look before COVID, before any of the circa 12 months ago, we already had some challenges I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the success syndrome, why companies fail to grow. I'm going to talk about how can we enable growth. And if I have time at the end, that last one is just a bonus section I've kept there, the role of leaders in making this happen. And as Janet told you, I'm focusing at the organization and leader level. Uh, my colleague Joshua Margolis is going to come and talk about it at the individual level. So starting with, so what do customers have more of today than they did 10 years ago? What do you think? It's like in any business, any market, anywhere in the world, how have markets changed? Forget about COVID, just in general, in the last decade. What do they have more of? Jasmine, thank you, choice. Tim, thank you, information. Information, choice, information, choice. We see a lot of that coming in and exactly right. Customers have unprecedented amount of choice and, and great amount of information. We call this, in economic terms, we call this the growing transparency in markets. Now, when markets become more transparent, what does that do to customers? How do customers start to behave? How are they different? How are they different? So there's more competition. Thank you, Steve. Karen is here, Very great. Time. Confused, Sashi, they're confused. So yeah, they're trying to sift through the information. They're overwhelmed. They're more critical answers, right? Value for money, Sonal is absolutely right. So they're looking for more powerful ever this pointing out. So less trust on brands, more educated. So you saw pressure building in markets. And this is a study that a consulting firm does every year. And they found competitive intensity has been kind of ratcheting up over more than a decade across industry around the world. So you saw this happening globally. Like I'm from India originally. Growing up in India, when I was growing up, my parents had to choose between one of three models of cars and they had to wait two years to get one of them. Now you have an overcapacity, a glut of vehicles, any kind of car you want, intense competition. Customers are much more demanding. Market leaders are losing leadership positions faster than them. This is interesting because it tells you that scale, the idea that I'm dominant, you know, starts to become less valuable. It, it creates less of an entry barrier as my colleague, uh, Mike Porter would call it, right? So there are a few entry barriers are going down. The benefits of scale of dominance in markets becomes you can't take it for granted anymore. And customers are less loyal to brands. I didn't say not loyal. I didn't say brands don't matter. I'm saying brands matter absolutely, but you can't do the old thing. Uh, I realized that Janet used to work at IBM. The old days in IBM, you could say, pay more for IBM. You never got fired for buying IBM, right? You can't lean on your brand like that anymore. You can't rely on your brand that my brand will sell itself and pressure on ROA. This was happening before COVID, right? The way I heard it from the companies I went to was people telling me, Professor, you don't understand my problem. My customers want efficacy. They want accessibility. They want brand and they want service and they want it all at low price, value as you guys were calling it, right? Or higher expectations. Now, this is in fact Target, the second largest discount retailer in the US. Their official tagline is expect more, pay less. Fortune magazine called it commodity hell, right? The sea of sameness, that it's really hard to look like different than anybody else. And the customer's gonna drive you down and kill your margin. And I'm not gonna do a finance lecture with all of you here, but I'll just keep it simple. If you look at four variables in a business, profit, volume, price, and cost. And today in most public markets, come, pressure is to drive profit and volume up. And in a transparent market, price starts to drive down. And so you're trying to manage your cost, but at the same time, give customer more value so he doesn't or she doesn't drive you into commodity hell. So customers expect more and want to pay less. 
the economic pressure that translates internally is we have to do more with less. So the expectation on us is we got to deliver more value to the customer, whether you're B2B or B2C, and we have fewer resources to do it. So there's a big squeeze in the market, squeeze from our customers to us, from us to our suppliers, from them to their suppliers, and so you have a massive squeeze building up. Now add to that. That was, I would have given this lecture to you 12 months ago, right? And then you add to that a global pandemic. And let's be very clear, the, the scale of global elementness of this pandemic is unprecedented, right? How extensive it has been globally. We have, let's not forget the climate crisis. And I call it a crisis because it is a crisis. And I'm not trying to take a political point of view here. All the data seems to suggest we have a crisis and we have an economic downturn. Again, these are things we are not even talking about. We're so focused on the vaccine. We're not talking about a climate crisis and economic downturn. We have technological disruption happening at an unprecedented scale. If some would say COVID maybe accelerated it in some ways. So working remotely in some ways has kind of ratcheted this thing up. So we have, and disruption means new entrants from Un unknown corners in markets. This is not your only Netflix killing blockbuster. You have in, whether it's in FinTech, whether you're looking at automotive, you're seeing new entrants in markets you hadn't seen entrants forever, right? And that leads to competitive disruption. And that, and this is happening for global companies because suddenly you see the resurgence of local, right? You suddenly see the resurgence of local. That becomes a whole story in and of itself. And you have add to that social upheaval, right? Long overdue, right? Had been festering, hadn't been dealt with. So suddenly now this is front and center. There's no walking away from that anymore or no putting it on the back burner. So, you know, you add, you add all these things up and this is unprecedented. The pressures in markets are unprecedented. And I think is, so I'm going to just focus on what happens to companies when they go through a decline, especially an economic downturn. But I'm gonna, we have all the other stuff happening at the same time as well. So I did a study with our, uh, our dean. Uh, uh, this is now a decade ago. And we, at that time, we had just come out of the great financial crisis. And I wanted to see what do companies do in down markets. And the three of us uh, got onto this project. And, and we wanted to see what happened to companies over the previous three recessions. We didn't have 2008 data at that time available to us completely. And we found 4,700 companies. And the idea was, how do companies cope with adversity? What do we find? 17% of companies in general don't survive a recession. 80% of survivors had not regained their pre-crisis growth rates three years after. They don't find their mojo back. And 40% had not regained their pre-crisis sales and profit levels three years after. So neither is the growth rate back, neither is your average performance back, and then, you know, we were very glib. We didn't have an answer how we were able to just show this effect. We said, oh, gotta be resilient. Gotta be resilient, come on, tough it up. Now, I wanna ask you this, and this word gets used a lot. This word in that, you know, we have our fashionable words, you know, I think in management, we have fads and fashions. The, you know, agility was in fashion for a while and now, you know, something else comes into fashion. So we have now resilience is the fashionable thing to talk about. So I want to start by asking you, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do some polls over here, guys. I'm going to use Zoom as best we can. So I'm going to do a poll. I want to ask you, how many of you think of yourself as a resilient leader? So I'm going to launch a poll. Let's see what we have, what we come up with. 